As you've just heard, my wife and I are the parents of six children. If you look closely at the screen, you'll also note something interesting about my family, and that is that my six children are all daughters. But this is Chanel uh, with a couple of her friends in, in our kitchen goofing off, and Chanel's just turned 17. I was driving to work with her, and I could tell as she drove that she was not happy. It might have been the way that she revved through the six gears on her way to top speed in the 60 zone, and, and, and she just wasn't happy. And, and I commented, I said, Chanel, you seem like you're unhappy. And she rolled her eyes, and I said, I get a sense that you're unhappy with me. And she said, yes, Dad, I am. And I said, I'm so glad that you've told me that. Could you tell me why? She said, well, sure. Today I found out that two weeks ago all of my friends had a party and they didn't invite me and I only just found out about it today. And when I asked them why they didn't invite me, they said, well, because it was the kind of party that Dr. Justin Coulson wouldn't have approved of. <sighs> and for those of you for whom the penny didn't drop, I'm Dr. Justin Coulson. And, and straight away I felt so bad for her. I thought, oh my goodness, my, my parenting is causing my daughter to be ostracized and isolated and to feel horrible and to miss out on opportunities to be with her friends but do I want her to have those opportunities? <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, you know, if they didn't invite you to a party that I wouldn't approve of, it sounds like there probably were a few things going on that are not consistent with our values. Uh, was there alcohol being consumed and potentially misused? She said, yes. I said, were there other drugs being consumed and potentially misused? She said, almost certainly. I said, were people disappearing into rooms for intimate encounters that they may or may not regret the next day? She said, possibly. I said, well, I'm really glad you weren't there. And so I said, do we need to revisit the rules? She looked at me and said, Dad, I know why we have the rules. I've been part of the conversations, remember? I said, oh, okay. I said, I want to ask you a tough question. You're nearly an adult. You're a year and a bit off being an adult. Now, I think these are good rules, but do we need to rethink the rules? And then I waited and my heart pounded. <laughs> and eventually she said, Dad, I don't like the rules. And my heart stopped. And I said, oh. and I started to think of how to respond. And as I was thinking, she jumped in and added something else for me. She said, right now, Dad, I don't like the rules one little bit. But they're good rules. I think we should keep them. This is the kind of line that every parent dreams of hearing from their kids. <laughs> The heavens opened and the angels started singing and I just wanted to hug her. I was like, yes. If, if you paid attention to the story, you don't get it by saying, well, damn it, they're good rules and I expect that you will keep them. That's part of being in this family. That's called control. And that's not how we get to this point. Instead, we get it through this thing called autonomy. Force creates resistance. But great relationships build autonomy which allows us to leverage trust, which builds massive influence. Thank you. This is the greatest lesson for parents. No one really truly loves anyone. Everyone loves conditionally. Most love is conditioned, control-based and fear-based. It's all about the self. So we live off prescriptive checklists and believe that if we don't follow that checklist, then we are somehow lesser than. And when we do this with a child who's come into this world with a throbbing spirit, desirous of kind of figuring it out, and we've kind of already ruined that chance by, you know, here's the checklist. This is what I believe is success and failure and beauty and achievement. And now follow my way or you're already an outcast in my eyes. This immediate placement of a way to be obscures the ability for the child to develop their way. And you will see most parents do not accept their children for who it is they are because they're not good enough or great enough or fabulous enough or not some accolade enough, not a degree enough. And then the, I show parents that the reason they can't do this, accept their child unequivocally for who it is they are, is because they haven't accepted themselves for who it is they are. The, the main battle is my child is not who I thought my child would be. Either not a superstar soccer player or a fantastic pianist or obedient, genuflecting little servant, you know. Most parents who are raised on a diet 
of overachievement on doing have a very hard time understanding that their drive is not organic necessarily, but coming out of their inadequacy, their fear, their lack. They've just been indoctrinated to compensate for this, and they've never fully healed from their encountering their ordinariness. And so when I say that that's what's driving you, and then they get in touch with their little boy or little girl who truly felt ordinary and not good enough in that ordinariness, that's when the epiphany occurs. So then I make them see how it's now being projected onto the child. Don't do this to your child. Your child is okay and whole in their ordinariness. The child doesn't need more to feel more of themselves. They didn't come with this egoic desire to attach to PhDs or labels or judgments or wealth to feel themselves. Children feel themselves just by who it is they are. They, are the, they have the simplest access to wholeness. We rob them of this. To truly love someone, it's truly loving the other for who it is they are, with no you in the picture. They don't have to love you back, they don't have to need you, they don't have to agree with you, they don't have to adhere to you. Now try loving your child for who it is they are. Kids are, are born scientists. They're always turning over rocks and plucking petals off of flowers. They're always doing things that by and large are destructive. And uh, <laughs> no, that's what exploration kind of is. If you, you take stuff apart, whether or not you know how to put it back together. This is what kids do. A, an adult scientist is a kid who never grew up. That's what an adult scientist does. So what happens at home is the kid reaches in the refrigerator, pulls out an egg, and starts juggling it. What's the first thing you do as a parent? Stop playing with the egg. It could break. Put it back. Excuse me, this is an experiment in the material strength of... <laughs> Let the kid find out that when it drops, it breaks. That's, that's, this, this is a physics experiment rapidly turned into a biology experiment, okay? The yolk oozes out, you say, hey, that becomes a chicky one day, okay? Wait, how does this gooey oak become a chicken? Well, that's biology, check that out. And what did the egg cost you, the 20 cents? President of Harvard once said, if you think education is expensive, you should try the cost of ignorance. So we don't have enough parents who understand or know how to value the inquisitive nature of their own kids because they want to keep order in their household. Kids go in into the kitchen and pull out all the pots and pans and start banging on them. What's the first thing you say as a parent? Stop making all that noise. Stop the racket. You're getting the pots and pans dirty. You just squashed an entire experiment in acoustics. So, I'm not worried about kids. People say, what can I do to get my kids interested in science? They're already interested in science. You're the one who's the problem. Almost my entire professional energy is focused on adults because they outnumber kids, they vote, they run the world, they wield opportunities. Kids will be fine. Children up until the age of four are operating at the genius level. The same group of children were studied in their early 20s and only 10% were still operating at the genius or what I call the brilliance level. And in their late 20s, early 30s, only 2% were still operating at the genius or brilliance level. So the question you have like I had is where did this genius or brilliance go? It didn't go anywhere, but it became buried by society that says color within the line, sit down, give it back, you can't do this. By the time a child is 17 years of age, they have heard no 150,000 times and only Yes, 5,000 times. And the more you continue to hear what you can't do, where you can't go, and who you can't become, there is a neurological path that is created in the brain that causes individuals to shut down. I have gone through a divorce within the last year, and my two children, Daniel and Madison, they are now my, my greatest joys. Madison came into my office not too long ago, and she said, hey, Daddy, what's going on? I said, hey, baby girl, how are you? And, and I was preparing to go on a trip out of town. And I was busy scurrying around. I was not totally focused on her. And she says to me, Daddy, I see you're busy. I'll just come back later. And I said, okay, baby girl. And, and, and I get on the plane later on, and it hit me that I missed a moment 
for spending that quality time with my baby girl because I was emotionally clueless and emotionally unavailable. Because I was so busy trying to make so much money that my ladder was against the wrong wall. And their mother said to me, you give everybody the best of you, but you give us the rest of you and I don't want the leftovers anymore. And what I recognized, I was modeling something for Daniel and Madison that you gotta go after, you gotta get all this stuff. And I had the house, but I lost the home. I had success, but I had no significance. I had power, but I had no purpose. And I had money, but I had no meaning. And what I discovered, if I continued to model that behavior for my baby girl, that she would marry a joker like me who ignored her like her dad did. So what I recognized is that I had to move from hearing Madison to listening to Madison. Because the same letters that spell the word listen spell the word silent. And when I have that time with my baby girl, I'm dialing in, how are you? And I'm modeling something for her brother as to how he's supposed to treat a woman. Women don't need us to fix anything. They just want to know, are we emotionally available and emotionally dialed in to know where they are? When it is time for you to make a U-turn and shift into your brilliance, we will have to come to a place where we're willing to do the work. It's not who you are that holds you back from brilliant success. It's who you think you're not that holds you back. And sometimes we focus on who we think we're not instead of who we are. So now, now I, I, through pain, I'm learning that relationships are more important than money. Now, now what's happening with the so-called teenagers? You got used to your child as a helpless creature. Now he is finding his own feet. Tch, you don't like it. You want to condense him. You do boo 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 my boo boo. <laughs> so children, when they come. When they are helpless and for everything they look up to you, you think your children are magical because they are helpless. <laughs> Suppose the baby popped out of you and stood up and said, Hey, who the hell are you? <laughs> you won't like this baby. <laughs> but he takes fourteen, fifteen years to ask that question. In fact, that is all a teenager is asking, okay, who the hell are you? <laughs> so, if you want to be somebody to that new fresh life which has come, you must not have defined boundaries of who you are. Like when the child was infant, when it crawled, you crawled with him. Now your teenager wants to swing, you must be able to swing with him. No, you still wants to crawl with him. <laughs> He's not interested. <laughs> He's beginning to ask. Parents are looking ridiculous in the eyes of adolescents. Your children are growing up, it should be a joyful moment. Yes? They become teenagers means they're growing rapidly. Yes? Or in other words, unfortunately they're beginning to become like you. No, Sadhguru, that is not the problem. They're beginning to become something different. <laughs> they don't even look like my children anymore. <laughs> Drop this damn thing that your child belongs to you. If you think this child belongs to you, when he's just becoming… coming into teens, he's telling you, God damn it, I don't belong to you. That's all he's trying to tell you which you're not able to digest. Another life does not belong to you. If another life has chosen to be with you, please cherish that. It's a tremendous thing.